Welcome everyone to this IES webinar, Utilising Remote Sensing and Machine Learning Artificial Intelligence to Support More Effective Land Management. Today we are delighted to be joined by Martin Broderick. Martin is a Principal Sustainability Consultant at Ramble. He has worked at the organisation for eight years where his primary focus has been on supporting clients in the delivery of strategic sustainability projects. Martin is now European lead for Ramble's Galago team, who utilise remote sensing and machine learning artificial intelligence to provide clients with insights for their land assets at a landscape scale, supporting them to deliver more sustainable outcomes. As always, there'll be a chance for questions at the end of Martin's presentation, so please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. You can do this at any point during the presentation, and I will then ask these on your behalf later on. Um, thank you so much for logging in today, and I'll now hand over to Martin. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to nice to be here, and, and thanks for for joining. I really appreciate it, uh, taking some time out. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to run you through this presentation today and give you a bit of a, a flavour of, of what we're involved with within the Galago team in Ramble. Uh, so just to run you through what I'll talk about today, just give you a bit of an introduction. To, to the organization and our team, a bit of context as to, to what, what we feel are the, the drivers in this space, and, and then how we'll, we'll run through a case study about how you can actually apply these kind of technologies to, to deliver better outcomes for biodiversity. Uh, I'll also touch upon what we're focusing on going forward, and then uh, I'll welcome any questions that you might have in this space. So for anyone that isn't familiar with Ramble, um, we are, I just thought it'd be worth giving you a quick introduction uh, we are of Danish origin, uh, a consultancy, multidisciplinary, uh, covering all the various disciplines that you could, you would imagine in terms of buildings, transport, energy, and, and so on. Um, and I think one of the key aspects that I always uh, focus on or, or highlight related to Ramble is actually our ownership. We are foundation owned. We don't have any shareholders, which allows us to, to be more flexible uh, and more, I think more in the long term in terms of our approach. And that really links into to what, what led to the Galago team. So uh, as an introduction, Galago it was launched through Rambo's Innovation Accelerator. So Ram Rambo has a range of different programs and uh, initiatives that lead to try and look for, for developing services and, and innovations within, within the organization. So Galago came about through Rambo's Innovation Accelerator back in 2019, which was a, a call to across colleagues, across those 17 and a half thousand colleagues to come up with ideas that could be internally funded and developed in order to try and deliver new services, enhance existing services, try and find means in, in which we can try and apply technology and innovation to, to lead to better outcomes. And Galago's focus is really about geospatial intelligence and the application of AI, artificial intelligence, to support consulting. And I'll I'll come back to Galago shortly um, because I think it first of all it's, it's about looking at the context uh, of where we are at this point in time. Given given the the, con the the audience that we've got today, I won't dwell too much on on, on the context because I think everyone's probably already fairly familiar with where we are, but. I think just to, to summarize really, we are in a crisis. We've lost 69% of wildlife populations in the last 50 years. Uh, and trends, recent trends suggest that, that that's now accelerating. Uh, we lost an area the size of Switzerland in terms of primary tropical rainforest last year. Uh, and whilst these statistics are quite emotive, I think it's also important to recognize the actual contribution that they make in terms of ecosystem services through the air we breathe, the regulation of our climate, the productive protection of our coastal areas and the pollination of our crops, to name a few. So, we, you know, we, we are we are in a hole uh, and all this is exacerbated by the other crisis, the climate crisis. And so that places a lot of additional stress uh, on species and also can lead to the, the expansion of other less desirable species. So, as I say, I, I'm sure that the audience is fairly familiar with this, so I won't dwell on this. Um, but these are the trajectories that, that I guess we're at at the moment, or we're, we're looking at, and I'm sure also you're familiar with this, but we've got this gray line, which is business as usual. So that, that's where we continue to rely on biodiversity. We, we overreach in terms of the, the use of the, the natural capital and the resources that the earth has without really having a, a sustainable approach. The yellow line represents the additional con conservation efforts and looking at a means by which we can start to address some of these issues but really we need to be looking at the green line if we're to, to try and develop a sustainable 
uh, approach to living uh, with, with harmony with nature. And that's about increasing our conservation efforts like the yellow line, but it's also about thinking about how sustainable our consumption is and how sustainable how sustainably we produce things as well. So it's about living within the planetary boundaries and ensuring that we can achieve that balance. Back in December last year, uh, we, we saw the, the signing of the Global Biodiversity Framework, COP15 in Montreal. And really, this is the culmination, or this is the vision of, of that green line and really trying to deliver against that. So the framework has four long-term goals for 2050 related to a vision, where that vision is by 2050, biodiversity is valued, con conserved, restored, and wisely used, maintaining ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy planet, and delivering benefits essential for all people. So a world living in harmony, essentially. So in harmony with nature. Um, and there are four overarching goals. Uh, and there are 23 targets to deliver by shorter term targets to deliver by by 2030 that feed into those goals. So I've, I've cherry picked a few goals and a few targets on the screen today, and there is reasoning behind that. Um, so I'm not expecting you to, to read them, but uh, what I will say is is that the first one is about integrity and understanding the resilience and the connectivity of our ecosystems and how you know how they're performing, how that how they are faring as a whole by 2050. Also, it's that understanding for goal B about biodiversity and how it's sustainably used and managed and the contribution that it makes in the ecosystem services. Target two is linked to 30 by 30, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with in terms of restoring degraded land. And target 15 is actually trying to understand how businesses interact with nature and understanding their impacts and dependencies and risks related to nature. So why have I I've pulled out those particular goals? Well, fundamentally, they all require data. They all require information in order to try and understand where we are in relation to that. How can we understand the connectivity and re resilience of our ecosystems without knowing where they are and how they're faring? Again, how can we understand how we interact with, with nature and how it functions and services and, and it can be valued without having data related to that? And the same goes for the the 30 by 30 target and understanding how businesses relate to you know, interact with nature. All of those things require data to allow us to understand you know, how, how biodiversity is responding to that and, and how we can ensure that we deliver positive outcomes. So really, how can we deliver better outcomes for biodiversity? Well, one of the things that the Gallego team are looking at is actually the contribution that AI can make for biodiversity. Often when we talk about biodiversity data and data associated with biodiversity, this can be large and complex. And so if we're to try and address the problem, we need to be looking at the scale of the problem and having generating information and insights at that scale. And so that's where the, the value of remote sensing can come in, in terms of trying to monitor at scale and look at trend at an ecosystem level as opposed to a site level. So when I talk about remote sensing, what I mean is, is related to uh, Earth observation imagery or data. So data from satellites, data from aerial imagery or data from drones, data that can be generated at scale relatively quickly. And then it's about the application of artificial intelligence to, to interpret that information and to allow us to, to more effectively and efficiently analyze that biodiversity data. Um, where maybe traditionally through through conventional means it would be almost impossible to be able to to actually assess that that, that information periodically. So it's a step change in terms of what what's possible now. I think you know some of the things that we're looking at couldn't have been done five years ago. So that it's really the the the, the trajectory and, and the scale and, and the speed in which things are evolving is really uh, exciting and it really represents an opportunity to try and better understand how biodiversity is faring. When we look at things in a climate sense, um, you know, when you talk about net zero, it's much easier to get your head around when you talk about emissions, carbon emissions, whilst the challenge is still huge, you can quantify emissions relatively easily through energy consumption, through costs and spend and things linked to that. Whereas obviously biodiversity doesn't have that, you don't have that ability to simplify things down to emissions. And so we need to come up with ways and, and means by which we can start to uh, interpret that information to allow for, for organizations, for, for land managers to better understand what's happening on the ground periodically. So 
how do we go about doing this? How do we help to, uh, you know, to apply artificial intelligence and, and remote sensing to actually generate some insights? Well, Galago has a four-stage model that it applies to its projects when, when trying to generate environmental insights. Um, and the first stage is, is about the remote sensing data. So it's really trying to understand what, what is the most appropriate data for the question you have. And often this is a choice between, between those three sources that I've mentioned around satellites, aerial, aerial imagery and drones. But different sensors can also be used as well. So we can think about thermal sensors, we can uh, think about infrared, we can think about a whole range uh, of, of sensors that will help to, to, to think about or help to, to generate the answer or the insight to the question that you might have. And it's also about the spatial scale as well. So if you think if you've got a, a, a relatively small site, then it's going to be more appropriate to think about higher resolutions. Whereas if we're thinking about a landscape scale across a particular region, or a particular country, in fact, um, then we start to think about satellite imagery as well. And, and we can, I have a few case studies that we can run through in a minute uh, that, that will help you to kind of look at the applications of these kind of remote sensing. Then we get into the, the analysis, the, the, I guess you could call it the black box, where we can utilize machine learning and AI and advanced geospatial analytics to start to automatically recognize and characterize the particular aspects of interest related to that original question. So thinking about its habitats, you know, how can we start to identify the particular habitats of interest or how can we start to look at the, the features of interest? And this all links to ground truthing and training models to, to identify things uh, in a robust manner. So once we've got the outputs of that, we, we get to the visualization. So thinking about how you present the outputs of, of that analysis, and that could be through a traditional approach that you might see in terms of reports, but more often than not, it's much more about presenting things visually through dashboards and through web apps to allow your you know, colleagues or, or to allow the organizations and the clients to actually interrogate the information themselves so that they can find out the answers that they're looking for. So it's a really powerful tool to allow you to start to even quantify some of this information as well where appropriate. And, and the last point is actually the interpretation as well. We are not working in isolation as a data science team. We are working with uh, our colleagues in the biodiversity team and, and experts across Ramble to interpret this, this, these outputs and this information. We're, we're, it's important to stress that we're not looking to replace any people through the insights that we're providing. It's more about enhancing the, the insights and, and the outputs that, that that can be used by our colleagues to provide better advice and more robust advice more periodically. So that, that's the, the term that we would use, it is about tech-enabled consultancy. So I have a case study to run through today, which links to national highways um, and some of the work that we, we did with them a, a couple of years ago. And so I'll just give you a quick introduction to the organization if you're not, not familiar with them, uh, but hopefully you can start to get a feel for why remote sensing and machine learning could be is well suited to an organization like National Highways. So uh, they are responsible for the strategic road network, which uh, is essentially the major motorways and A roads across England, which covers a, an area or the length of about 7,000 kilometers. But linked to that and importantly to what we're thinking about today in terms of better outcomes for biodiversity and more effective land management, it's, uh, they have an associated soft estate, so land adjacent to the, the carriageways of 30,000 hectares. And really, there's a step change now in terms of recognizing the contribution that that soft estate can make. Previously, maybe uh, in years gone by, it was thought of in terms of maintenance and ensuring safety, whereas now actually there's a recognition of the contribution that that can make in terms of biodiversity or carbon sequestration, flood resilience or, or flood, uh, flood risk. Uh, flood alleviation, uh, and also in terms of installation of, of photovoltaics, uh, to name a few examples. So really the, the key thing is actually we need to understand or better, an organization like National Highways needs to better understand what's there to allow them to, to understand and track, track what's going on. And that's linked also to their corporate commitments that have been made around biodiversity net gain by 2040. And obviously we've got um, net gain coming in January, mandate, uh, to be mandatory in January, but we also have NSIPs coming in to be enforced uh, by 2025 as well. So there's a lot of drivers in this space that means it's, it's useful and it's, it's really important to actually better understand what you have across quite a large uh, estate. 
And this also links to their environmental sustainability strategy. So this was published back in May of this year. And, and the, they have a, a really, uh, I think, up their level of ambition in terms of their vision, but also in, in terms of their focus. Uh, and the, this vision is, is around a, a connected country and a thriving environment. And we have these strategic outcomes linked to nature, carbon and communities and these priority areas. And what I, I think is important to, to highlight about this wheel is, is this really uh, holistic approach and thinking about things much more about in, in the sense of solutions and opportunities uh, as opposed uh, and multiple benefits as opposed to thinking in, of them in, in silos around air quality or biodiversity problems, for example. So it's really a step change. And I think that recognition has, has come about because it, it's really important to, to look at the value and the potential contribution that the soft estate can make. So, so. so the first the first uh, part of the, the project that we worked on, we worked uh, with, with National Highways to look at how we could apply these kind of innovative techniques to support those outcomes and those commitments uh, linked to the strategy. And, and the first point is, is around actually the, the biodiversity baseline. National Highways already have a, a biodiversity baseline that they're working towards, but actually can there's a question as to whether remote sensing can potentially provide the means by which you can track that more, more effectively over time because what we have to think about is actually if we want to deliver net gain or if we want to make sure that our biodiversity is is maturing in the way that that it, we hope it will then we need the means and the, the approach with which to, to actually track that on the ground when we talk about thirty thousand hectare uh, soft estate that's obviously becomes incredibly difficult to actually send people out uh, to cover that whole area with, with confidence so that's where that's where remote sensing comes in and we've got SATA we used to develop a model using satellite to sentinel uh, sentinel to satellite imagery and we trained a machine learning uh, AI model so essentially what you do is you get the imagery and then you have training data where you know these habitats to be present after a while as the as the machine model learns, the learn, machine learning model learns, uh, it, it starts to then be able to distinguish distinguish and differentiate between the different habitat types. So you have the different spectral signatures of those habitats, allowing you to start to differentiate between woodland or grassland, or, or the various different types. And we've actually uh, we're able to generate a land cover map for the fourteen most common habitat types across the the SRN. I mean, Hopefully that's big enough to see on your screen of the ones that we are able to identify. So why is this useful? As I say, it's about establishing your biodiversity baseline and it's about also supporting that performance reporting and that strategic decision making at a landscape scale. If we were really to try and reverse or improve that curve in terms of biodiversity, we need to think about things at a landscape scale and start to think about how we can more strategically identify opportunities for enhancement and actually start to hold people to account in terms of, of, of activities that have taken place. It's that repeatability that remote sensing can offer. So once the model is trained, it, it's about refining it year on year, but ultimately that model is there and able to, and the processes and, and the workflows are automated that allows you to generate those insights relatively easily uh, year on year and allows you to also start to be able to quantify the, those, those trends over time. Linked to some linked to that, there's also value at the project scale as well as the strategic scale. When we think about the early insights uh, at a project level, when when national highways are, are looking to develop new schemes or improvements, these kind of tools can help to generate early insights at that route or site selection stage and think about actually can we avoid some of these impacts by by generating habitat maps or generating insights maybe before ecologists would traditionally be on the ground. And this is the value that, that potentially um, these kind of solutions can offer is often at the start when you're looking insights at the early stage where you wouldn't have surveyors going on the ground and at the end when we're looking at monitoring and making sure that, that actually things are, are being delivered on the ground. So that's, that's at the kind of national regional level, but we can also apply these kind of solutions at, at the local or site level as well. And one of the other particular challenges for, for national highways is around invasive plant species. Obviously, that network has a large um, surface area. And so we need to, uh, they need to be able to ensure that invasive species are, are managed and doesn't, doesn't try and move on to adjacent landowners' um, properties. And so 
this is a real challenge and also actually tracking them over time is a real challenge and the, the principles of, the, of uh, the, this approach are very much the same as the satellite habitat identification approach it's just applying different imagery so high resolution drone imagery and a training a model to actually start to identify invasive plant species and this particular example was uh, giant hogweed and so we were able working with our ecologist to delineate stands of giant hogweed that could then the model could then learn about the characteristics and the shape and the nature of those those invasive plant species and then it can start to then predict the, the, the locations of those invasive plant species so the, the the image you have on the left is is all the orange dots that you can see are where the, the model has actually identified giant hogweed to be present and through ground truthing and validation actually our ecologist was really impressed about actually the effectiveness of of that model and the, really the value there's a, a range of different values that this can offer or benefits that this can provide in terms of the, the cost effectiveness and the time of actually being able to just fly a drone and then the, that again that process is automated with which the model can then identify it once it's got, it's got that imagery back from the drone from a practical point of view thinking about national highways uh, it's actually easier and safer to fly a drone rather than having people uh, next to the, the live carriageway uh, and that applies to other other linear infrastructure organizations like network rail as well that there's a real value and contribution that drones can make in terms of improving coverage and line of sight of some of these uh, invasive plant species and and also thinking about removing people from potentially uh, fast moving vehicles and there are other applications. We're also working globally, I should say, as, as the Galago team, and we've also worked quite a lot in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where there's potentially other risks around landmines and other safety risks, where remote sensing can provide a really effective means of helping to, to look at the, the, the characteristics of sites. And that's, this is transferable. So you, we, we used it for identifying invasive plant species in this example, but you could equally apply that to high value species of interest or hard assets, for example, of particular features within buildings as well. So it's about that image recognition really, and then that characterization. So there's one more example, and I've been a bit sneaky here because this, this doesn't link to national highways, but it is linked to effective land management. So we've talked about habitats and establishing a baseline. So thinking about what you have and how you can, how you can support the enhancement or the improvement of, of that land. Then we've talked about the, the potential presence of certain indicator species or, or at risk or risk species linked to invasive plant species, for example. But one of the other things that we're, we're, we're really focusing on is actually vegetation and health and condition. And this can have a, this is really about understanding the, about the health of, of habitats and understanding how they're faring linked to those other aspects. So are, are things uh, developing? Are they are they growing? Are they evolving in the, in the way that we would like? And obviously, when we start to introduce things like climate change and drought and the stress of vegetation, then this becomes even more important. So again, we can use aerial and satellite imagery, various sensors, and we can use indices like NDVI, so Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which is essentially a, an indicator of photosynthesis and the health of a plant by understanding how effective that photosynthesis is to try and understand how that that vegetation is faring. This is, example is in Australia for a, an aluminium refinery, which is adjacent to protected sites where we need to understand the health of those trees and to look to try and ensure that actually they're delivering, that they're, they're introducing the necessary mitigation measures so that we can uh, we can minimize the impacts on, the, on those, those, um, those protected sites nearby. So we can start to track that through NDVI and through understanding Actually, are there, are there stands of trees that are being impacted upon by certain activities? And we can flag that to, to the, the client and then they can try and introduce the, the, the steps necessary to try and address those issues. So as I say, it's one of the key things that I think that a lot of people have highlighted is a challenge around the use of remote sensing is around understanding the condition of habitats. And so we need to be able to ensure that actually we have proxies and means by which we can start to see that habitats are, are doing okay. And this is really critical to that monitoring process, whether that's at a project level, and we're trying to understand the effectiveness uh, of the tree planting process and actually whether trees are reaching, reaching maturity or whether we're looking at a much broader scale across a whole portfolio of, of land or, or you know a large landowner. So these are the kind of tools that we feel are really 
uh, useful and insightful to allow land managers to try and understand how to effectively manage their land. Going, so I just uh, got a couple minutes left, so I just wanted to touch quickly upon what our focus is going forward and how the yeah, particular areas where we feel these kind of um, solutions can can provide most value. So. There are three particular areas that we feel are most useful when we, when we talk about organizations with large land holdings or where there are land managers uh, that, that really need to think about these kind of particular aspects. So corporate reporting, we have a range of different mandatory and non-mandatory corporate reporting frameworks that are either live or due to go live soon. So um, uh, I'll, 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 tell you, I'll, I'll shout out to the, the abbreviations if you're not familiar with them. So Corporate Sustainability Reporting uh, Directive, which is in the EU. Obviously, there's a lot of links with, with UK companies and making sure that we're aligned with CSRD, Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure and Science Based Targets for Nature. All of these different aspects require, will require some form of geospatial data to understand an organization's interaction with with nature and their dependency so all of these processes are the, the frameworks are all relatively um trying to get the same outcomes and trying to get the same insights but fundamentally if we're trying to understand our impacts and uh, and interactions with, with nature then again we need geospatial data to be able to to, to have confidence in in, in being able to communi communicate those interactions i touched upon biodiversity net gain already um but really this can potentially provide a lot of useful insights at that early stage, as I touched upon, but also at that monitoring stage as well. When we think about uh, limited resources and budgets and often historically post-project monitoring has, has been neglected in terms of trying to ensure that effect the, the commitments and the conditions held for each, each particular development are actually delivered on the ground uh, uh, have been fairly limited and so actually remote sensing can potentially provide that effective means, particularly when we start to think about biodiversity net gain and that 30 year monitoring period, actually remote sensing potentially provides the, the means by which that could effectively be done with, without using um, significant amounts of budget. And linked to what we have here, it's also about thinking about management as well. So how, how can we bring all this together to actually start to develop a biodiversity strategy and start to uh, think about a land management strategy that provides the most effective means by which we can ensure that, that the best outcomes can be delivered for biodiversity uh, and also actually we're looking to support land managers in, in achieving their particular priorities as well. So it, it's, it's pulling together all of these different uh, solutions, all of these different offerings and, and, and trying to develop uh, insights that actually can help to guide that management process over time. It's also thinking about risks and opportunities as part of that process as well and working to look at what, you know, what can be the best outcomes for, for the landowner. So that, that's our focus, I guess, um, at this stage. And we're, we're, we are working with a range of different uh, organizations to support these activities. So I will call it a day there and, and uh, I would really welcome any questions that anyone has any whether they're technical around around remote sensing and AI or whether it's more about the applications um, and you've got my email address on on the slide if you'd like to find out any more do do reach out and it'd be great to have a chat with anyone who's interested thank you so much Martin um can I just check that my sound is coming through okay yeah I can hear you okay Perfect. Okay. Um, that was so interesting to hear about how um, AI can be used to support um, improved biodiversity. So thank you so much for that overview. Um, as uh, as you've just said, uh, to all our attendees, please do put your questions in the Q&A function. Um, we're going to go hop straight into these now. Uh, we've already got some coming through. Um, so one of our attendees says, thank you, Martin. Um, similar to your excellent example about invasive species, could these systems be used to identify individual tree species for woodland biodiversity net gain condition assessments? Uh, uh, yes, I think in theory, yes. The, I think that's that would be really interesting, actually, and one we haven't really thought about that much yet. But what the yes, I guess, is, is the short answer. And, and to elaborate on that, really, what we're looking for when we look at giant hogweed as the invasive plant species, that, that's exactly what we're talking about in terms of the transferability of that. So if we had examples of particular tree species that were interested in terms of that assessment, then then yes, we could start to delineate those, those that training data of, of what the, the, the species are of interest. And then you could then train the model to start to identify those particular tree habit, 
tree species. So obviously those trees will have a distinctive style, uh, characteristics. And, and so, yes, I think in, we haven't actually done it ourselves, but in theory that that's, that's certainly doable. Great, thank you. Um, the next question says, um, the use of AI seems to be more based on classification of current land uses. Is AI driven predictive modeling of the consequences of particular changes being considered? For example, showing a projection of how a given change will alter the landscape in a certain time period? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think at, at the moment, what we're looking at is, is what's there at the moment. Um, and so, it's more about, as you say, monitoring and looking at where where we are now, and potentially we we haven't thought, and we're monitoring over time to see how things evolve. I think there is an extra thing to think about, as you say, in terms of modelling and thinking about how things could evolve. And one of the things we are talking about is is looking at optimization of land management and thinking about if you were to do certain things or what what would be the old the ideal outcome. So how do you you start to balance these things in terms of thinking about what's best for biodiversity, but also maybe what's best for carbon sequestration. So you, then you start to think about these dynamics around natural capital. So the, it's definitely interest, something we're looking at and interested in, in terms of scenario modeling and, and seeing about the different outcomes. Um, but I guess at the moment, what our focus is on is on what, you know, what's there, but that, that's certainly a strand that we are, we are thinking about as well. Great, thank you. Um, and then in your presentation, you mentioned kind of the use of um, this kind of technology for monitoring, especially around something like biodiversity net gain. Um, yeah. So one of the questions here is, is it possible to ensure that a client has followed the plan, for example, increase the condition of a woodland by reducing herbivore damage or adding deadwood onto site? Or does this really work well only in more open spaces, like in your giant hogweed example? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, but yeah you've highlighted limit one of the limitations really in terms of obviously when you're when you're operating from above there when you have certain habitats like a woodland for example then yeah you, you're going to struggle to maybe identify some of the stuff below the canopy so that's i guess that's where you start to think about the the benefits of a kind of hybrid approach where you maybe have high level insights that can be provided through remote sensing, but ultimately you still need an ecologist to go around and check some of these different things. I think, you know, some of what we're doing can be used for that, that audit process and through monitoring and ensuring that actually we're, we are delivering, or sorry, a, a client is delivering uh, against plans and they're committed to those, but then there are other aspects around the, the points that you've highlighted around maybe damage to vegetation and, and deadwood that, that may actually require an ecologist. So it, what we're thinking about is maybe highlighting certain issues that can be a red flag to send ecologists out, but ultimately there may be other aspects that ecologists need to go out on site to actually check and validate as well. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, a more technical question. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, but um, what is the pixel resolution that you've chosen to map habitats in? Yeah, great question. Um, so the National Highways example was 10 meter pixels um that was a few years ago now um the what we're looking at now we have a subscription with planet day uh, planet uh and they have imagery at four meters so it really depends i think i touched upon it earlier about what we're operating at when we're operating at the habitat uh we're mapping habitats and looking at scale at a region for example then that's the kind of pixel size that we're looking at when we're looking at maybe a site level and we could map habitats at a site level then we can get much much uh, higher resolution so thinking about 50 centimeter pixels from from satellite imagery where we can task satellites to capture imagery or we can think about using drone imagery which is very high resolution when we get down to the single centimeters um, but again as I say it's really getting back to that point and so I think over time we'll, we'll start to see that satellite imagery getting much higher resolution at scale so we can start to be able to differentiate more effectively the differences between habitats uh, at, at kind of a satellite imagery scale rather than a, a drone level but yeah that's kind of where we're at at the moment. That's really interesting thank you um, and have you trialed this technology in the marine environment? Um, one of our attendees has said it would be great to be able to map seagrass and macroalgal species without getting divers in and also to thank you great talk. Uh, we we have we've had some initial conversations with our colleagues. We've got a few people working in the marine environment. We haven't really explored it fully, but I think it would be really good to to think more about 
yeah, macroalgae and seagrasses because I think one of the challenges we've had with our marine colleagues is trying to find the right, most appropriate sensors to use within the marine environment where maybe you can't always capture stuff through aerial imagery or you know from 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 imagery so we need to think about actually how you capture things within the marine environment but i think if we're talking about macroalgae and seagrasses then that's potentially still visible from from some of this imagery sources so it would be really interesting to explore that a little bit further uh, we've had similar conversations around you know monitoring at wind farms and trying to monitor bird species and, and the interactions that wind farms have with those and there's other solutions that are available in that space as well but be really keen to, to think a bit more about that, that particular question that you've highlighted as well. Great thank you um still a lot of questions coming in which is great um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. um so um you mentioned of course in your examples the idea of kind of mapping habitat types and even down to specific species yeah. um do you think there's applications that could also be considered in terms of identifying and monitoring animal species as opposed to plant species yeah yeah definitely i think obviously there's a slightly more practical challenge of animal species um because they move <laughs> so uh, uh, vegetation is often easier for, for the reason that you know it's, it's it's there it's stationary and so it's easier to track her but uh i'm aware of certainly i know of a, some work done in australia not not by us by someone else who used infrared sensors on a drone at night to be able to identify koalas and kangaroos in certain areas of interest through through their basically their thermal imaging so um, I guess it kind of depends on the animal species of interest, but it certainly can be done. Uh, and it's something we haven't explored properly yet. But I guess our, probably our thought process, similar to the net gain metric in many ways, is I guess if the habitat's there, then the hope is the species are there. But if there's a particular question about the species, then, then yeah, we, we could potentially explore that. Um, Great. And I guess a kind of easier uh, part of this is, um, uh, again, in, in, adv in addition to vegetation mapping, I assume a similar approach can be used for physical features, for example, identifying ditch blocking as part of peatland restoration, for example. Exactly. That's exactly it. It's, it, you know, one of the examples I didn't touch upon here was we, we also looked at driven survey imagery for national highways to try and help identify noise barriers and maybe where noise barriers have been damaged for some reason. So yeah, you, you can also pick out hard features as well. It doesn't have to be nature related. It could be you know, something more practical. We've had some initial conversations with rail colleagues as to whether you know, the cameras on the front of trains, we could use that imagery to start to identify particular cabinets or certain you know, railway infrastructure of interest that, that, that may, be, you know, may be useful to identify through these kind of uh, approaches. Great, thank you. Uh, and kind of running with that um, peatland example, um, there's a question here that in terms of practicality, if someone's interested in modelling change over time, for example, um, for a peatland example, where we may want to monitor vegetation condition following restoration to assess the success of activity, would yeah. you set up a model that could be rerun by the client each year or would you be contracted to rerun it yourself each year? Uh, just in terms of kind of the practicality, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. And it's... Um... It's something that I think it would be on a case by case basis. So I think, you know, obviously we would develop the model, but equally we, you know, we could, we can hand over the model to the client for them to then use it. But I think obviously with, with these kind of solutions, if you were to rerun it year on year, there may be some need for refinement. So we need to think about that and whether there's the expertise within the organization to do that or whether the, you know, the, there's outside you know it requires external support to deliver that i think that the point to make is though the model once the model's developed the cost year on year obviously significant reduced because that that development has already happened in that initial process and so the monitoring subsequent to that it should be relatively um you know light touch in terms of just refining that model uh, as as and where needed really Right, thank you. Um, and then you, you you briefly touched on this, but um, how is the AI accuracy verified? So presumably this is done via site visits, but how much of land cover is actually quality assured to ensure this accuracy? For example, is it based on a certain percentage of a sample or, or how does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So a lot of what, what is done so far is so, as I think I hopefully touched upon in the presentation, we have ground truth training data. So whenever we have a model, 
we train it with known habitat data, if we use that example, or, or known species data. So where we know it to be present, so we have confidence that it can learn on that basis. Um, but we, what we also do as part of that process is, is um, retain some of that training data to, to use as validation. So basically where we test the model on that ground truth data that wasn't fed into the model to learn, but it was more about actually thinking about, um, yeah, understanding the accuracy of it. So obviously accuracy and prediction accuracy is, is incredibly important when we're talking about this so that we have confidence of what the model predicts is is, the, is on the ground, you know, actually is, 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 is the reality. So that's, that's one of the things that we're obviously super important. And one of the other things that we're thinking about at the moment is we're looking to work with our ecologists to develop habitat maps for each of each of the surveys that they do. They will then go out and refine it because often when we talk about net gain, they need to take it to an additional tier, tier of classification. They can then update that and refine that model in, in their iPads when they go out, and then that can go back into the model and improve the model accuracy as a result of that. So we get that feedback loop that hopefully should mean that the model constantly improves as a result of, of, of our ecologists' work on the ground. So that's our, I guess, our, our safety measures to make sure that we're, we're hopefully, you know, the, the outputs are relatively robust from what we're doing. Great. Um, and you kind of touched on this then in your answer, but um, so are models site specific or are they generic for all the potential terrain and climates? And how long on average does training each model take? Yeah, uh, so there there is a certain need to be geograph uh, to be specific to the geography when we when you develop a model. So where, when we so, for example, I think when we, we developed the model for national highways with with um, the habitat map for the SRN, that's probably a model that you could use in England. But maybe if you went north of the border to Scotland, then we might have to adapt it slightly because of the changing in term, uh, changing in terms of the maybe habitats present, but also you know the, the seasons being slightly different and and some of those kind of seasonal variations that you might get equally if we were to develop you know if we were to develop a model in Spain, you know, the, the model in, in the UK or England maybe wouldn't quite be appropriate. So often it's more about an adaptation than, than a full scale change, but the, there does need to be some recognition that the model will have to be adapted according to the, the specific habitats of that region, for example. In terms of the development of a model, I think, again, it, it really depends on what the scale is that we're operating at, but um, I think it'd be fair to say couple of months I think is probably that full process of, of actually going from from the starting point to to a model that actually starts to identify but obviously what we're what's important in that process is actually the training data and having confidence of of those outputs as a, as a result of that so that's a, a guideline I suppose there's kind of leeway either side <laughs> um, hopefully that helps that's really helpful. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, and thank you to everyone who's answered those questions. I'm afraid that's all we have time for in terms of questions, but um, really appreciate um, you answering all of those um, and to all of our attendees for putting them in. Um, so a massive thank you to you, Martin, for your presentation today. It was so interesting. Uh, and thank you to all of our attendees for logging in as well. Um, and if you're an IES member, don't forget to record your attendance um, using the IES CPD tool, which you can access um, in the members area of our website. Um, this webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on our website and YouTube channel. Uh, and if you are watching the recording on YouTube, please do subscribe to our channel, like the video and hit the bell to gain notifications of new content. Um, our next webinar will be held on the 14th of November and is on empowering environmental decision making, unveiling the collaborative evidence services of CEE. Uh, and as usual, you can book this on the IES website. A massive thank you once again to you, Martin, and to all of you for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.